Now it's time for today's perspective on the programme and my guest today is a real carer and let's be honest we could all do with one of those nowadays. She uh, has a career born from being cared for herself. Dame Elizabeth Anionwu was uh, inspired to become a nurse at the age of just four. She was treated herself for severe eczema. She was born in Birmingham in the UK. She identifies herself as of Irish and Nigerian heritage and that carry really fed through into her life. She started working for the National Health Service as a school nurse assistant at the age of 16 and since then she became Britain's first nurse specialist on the blood disorders sickle cell anemia and thalassemia and she later became a professor and dean of the nursing school at the University of West London. She's worked tirelessly as well to address racial inequalities in her profession. She was even honoured with a damehood in the 2017 Queen's New Year's Honours List for her services to nursing and the Mary Seacole Statue Appeal. Thanks very much for uh, joining us on the programme today. Um, let me first talk about this caring in you because that's what I, I see when I, I read about you and I hear about you and it was actually ignited wasn't it if you like by a nurse nun who uh, you say told rude jokes and use words like bottom. <laughs> that's right uh, something you wouldn't expect from a, a Catholic nun in the children's uh, home that I grew up in until I was nine I should say and uh, she, I always associated her with not having any pain. Whereas the other nuns, I don't think they did it deliberately. They just tear off the bandage and it would really, really hurt and I would cry. But this other nun, she was an absolute delight. And when I discovered she was also called a nurse, I thought that's what I want to do. So a lot of positives, but still a, a difficult childhood for you. I mean, it was a, a childhood, wasn't it, scarred by racism? Yes. I, first of all, I'm 73. And so uh, you have to remember, uh, there weren't that many brown skinned children in, in Britain at that time. There were some, but not uh, as you would see today. So my arrival to uh, my mother, who wasn't married, was Catholic, was at Cambridge University, where she'd met my father, who was studying law, was was, was an absolute bombshell to, to my family. And they were actually going to adopt me, uh, but the priest said, no, 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 no. This would cause shame, scandal, because she's coloured. And of course, there were terms like half caste used as well in those days. So that was the entry to my life that was clouded by having a brown skin. And you managed to power through that, though, didn't you, and, and take up nursing. You were very shy, you say, when you started, though. Oh, I was incredibly shy, believe it or not. Uh, I used to, go, when we went to change our wards, we did every three months or so, I was so scared I would go into the room where we would wash what we call the bedpans, uh, anywhere to get away from new people. My stomach would be sick with fear. Gradually, I overcame that, thank goodness. And then you powered on once again, um, became a, a specialist, if you like, a nursing specialist, that expert in sickle cell and thalassemia. Tell us how that came about. Yes, it was particularly for sickle cell anemia, which mainly affects the uh, people of African heritage, but others as well. And it's a very severe blood disorder. And when I was a health visitor in London, in 1971, I came across some families with children affected by it and realised I didn't know anything about it because I hadn't been taught in any of my nursing courses. And this actually made me very angry and drove me to find out more about it and discover when I went to visit the States that nurses could become specialists in this condition. And that's why I became the first UK nurse specialist in sickle cell anemia and thalassemia. I would have thought that was enough, but you went on even further. I'm going to use that powered um, word once again. You went on to set up the Mary Seacole Centre for Nursing Practices. I mean, your aim was to, to, to take that experience of your racial inequalities in your, in your younger years and, and try and improve that for, for people nowadays. Yes, that's right. I, looking back, having written my memoirs, it made me realise that I had, if you like, a ball full of anger in my belly in my stomach, deep, deep, deep down, which produced anger. Now, anger can be negative or positive. And I believe, fortunately for me, instinctively, my anger was transferred into positive energy that drove me, and I'm open to admit this, drove me 
to make life better for other nurses, for example, so that they could progress faster in their career, uh, obviously being qualified to do that and wanting to do that, because there was uh, a lower number of black uh, nurses, for example, in the higher echelons of the nursing hierarchy, which was not correct. And you've now retired. I suspect it's a bit of a semi-retirement, isn't it? I know you wanted to spend more time with your, your grandchild as well. But when you look back over what you've done, I mean, do you, how much do you think you've been able to contribute to things changing? And, and do you think things have changed enough within the NHS? I'm thinking specifically of racism, I suppose. Well, it's, it's changed, but not enough. Uh, certainly, my granddaughter wouldn't have to do what I did as a small child, which was wash my face ten times uh, uh, to try and become white like my friends. My granddaughter is very proud, uh, as is my daughter, of who she is, what her skin colour is. That is absolute progress. But we just have to watch the news uh, to see that racism is still there, sadly. I'd, I'm very naive, I suppose, but I just wish that people wouldn't consider other people inferior just because they've got a different skin colour. It's absolutely stupid. I feel very strongly about this. And why do you think people still do? Because you would have thought after all the changes um, that have come around the world, you know, particularly uh, in places where you are, I don't know where you live now, but in London, Birmingham, places like that, it's a very mixed culture, isn't it, for, for most people? You're absolutely right. I, th I think there's an inherent risk in all of us to wish to be superior to others. I don't, I don't, I'm not a philosopher. I don't know where that comes from. Uh, however, it's enabled by what we see around us and those in authority practicing uh, racist attitudes and also people not being held accountable always for when they are racist. So I think it's, a, it's, it's all sorts of factors like this uh, that contribute to this very sad situation. And I mentioned um, at the beginning there that um, you were uh, given that uh, award by the Queen in, in 2017, CBE, and I, I understand there was a congratulation card in it which said, I know you're in two minds about all this, but what CBE stands for in your case is cool, black and exceptional. Yeah, wasn't that wonderful? Because I didn't like the empire bit. Britain no longer has an empire. We should find something else to replace the letter E. Excellence is is, is the obvious one, I should have thought. Uh, so, yeah, I was very pleased. And that, that CBE was actually a few years before my Damewood. So I think the D should stand for determined, actually, <laughs> <laughs> because determination has helped me enormously. And also, obviously, I have to stress, working with others can do nothing on your own. Certainly shines through. Thanks very much for joining us on the programme today. Dame Elizabeth uh, and Eon, we're very, very determined uh, woman. Good to have her uh, with us on the programme today. Thanks for joining us. The main news headlines then on Live from Paris. Key French ministers meeting with President Emmanuel Macron in a few hours' time to decide on probable new lockdown restrictions for several areas of France, including the Paris region. Coronavirus figures are all up as the Prime Minister has warned of a third wave. And the former French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, due to go on trial later, accused of uh, financing his failed 2012 re-election campaign illegally. The trial less than three weeks after he was convicted in another case.